Today we are entering our two final lectures on the Victorian age. So this is part one, lecture 11. In literary terms, the Victorian age corresponds nearly perfectly with the long reign of Queen Victoria, 1837-1901. This reign saw the acme of both British economic supremacy resulting from the Industrial Revolution with no real competition until the 1880s and British power on the world stage, materialised in a colonial empire having reached 33 million square kilometres and 450 million subjects by the dawn of the 20th century. As to the acme of literary production, that is quite another debate, but the sheer bulk of remarkable prose and poetry, though drama declined, forces me to devote two separate lectures to our exploration. The present lecture will therefore only deal with prose, including, of course, the vast territory of Victorian novels, from, say, Charles Dickens to Thomas Hardy. In order to survey it, I have adopted the classic division of the era into an early Victorian period, 1830s and 1840s, a core mid-Victorian period, 1850s to mid-60s, and a late Victorian period, 1870s to the 1900s. So let us begin with early Victorian prose, stemming from the debates of the Hungary 40s. At least on the surface, the age of Romanticism had ended fairly peacefully, with aristocratic Tory governments apparently in power forever, radical protest extinguished, at least in Britain, and a stable Europe restored by the Congress of Vienna after Waterloo in 1815. As to the literary world, a lull in the emergence of new trends seemed to have set in, and, as if clearing the stage for a new era, most great Romantic poets and writers, apart from Wordsworth, had actually died by 1835. Yet things soon changed. Queen Victoria ascended the throne in 1837 after the short reign of her uncle William IV at a time of growing political and economic trouble which lasted nearly for a whole decade and only came to an end with the symbolic triumph of the Crystal Palace Exhibition of 1851. Politically, the 1832 Reform Act had engaged the process of extending the franchise and gradually conceding power to the middle classes. But some wanted much wider and faster change, most prominently the Chartists, whose agitation in the 1840s nearly brought about a similar revolution in London to those which took place in nearly all major capitals of Europe in 1848. Economically, the massive consequences of the Industrial Revolution were becoming obvious for the first time. Britain was no longer a rural nation, and a large working class had agglomerated in vast new urban areas without any adequate structures or state intervention to take care of them. Moreover, an economic slowdown, for reasons we can't go into here, was placing the nation at a crossroads. The landed interest wanted to keep tariffs on grain imports, the so-called Corn Laws, while the industrial north wanted to remove them and develop free trade to base economic growth on exports. Since the Corn Laws artificially prevented imports, the price of basic foodstuffs increased and, with zero margins for adjustment, this meant hunger for the working class, hence the name of the next decade, the Hungry Forties. Free traders eventually won the day in 1846. Britain entered the long liberal area era, sorry, and managed indeed to solve problems by becoming the workshop of the world, exporting its way to massive growth until the 1870s. Important prose writers, historians, essayists and novelists took sides in this debate. The first important name to be mentioned is that of Thomas Carlyle. This Scottish-born essayist, pamphleteer and historian with a remarkable, forceful style 
became known as the Sage of Chelsea on account of the growing audience acquired by his books. Channeling German ideas, especially Goethe and yet again Transcendentalism, with Sartor Resartus, 1833, Predicting Chaos, with his History of the French Revolution, 1837, Understanding Protest, with Chartism, 1840, but advocating strong leadership as the solution with On Heroes, Hero Worship and the Heroic in History, 41, Carlyle managed to influence a whole generation with Past and Present, 1843. Known to every Victorian intellectual and artist for its thorough condemnation of the Industrial Revolution based on comparing the present state, the so-called condition of England, with the social system surrounding the Abbey of Bury St Edmunds in medieval times, it tallied perfectly with the Gothic revival and soon to emerge pre-Raphaelitism. This will be further explained in the next lecture. In fact, it appealed to nearly all groups, though sometimes for contradictory reasons. Tories and radicals alike, middle-class readers, idealists, mystics, even Engels, liked some of it. Novelists equally decided to describe the condition of England. Future Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli probably wrote the clearest analysis with Sybil or the Two Nations. Still laden with the style of his previous Silver Fork novels, another conceptual term you should know about, and this is defined as usual in the footnotes, Still laden with that and lots of romantic cliches, the novel nonetheless studies a mining town and all its related socio-economic mechanisms to conclude on the existence of two nations. Uh, this is really a passage everybody knows who's ever done any studies uh, on the history of England. Um, at one moment in the book, there is this little dialogue. I, I've cut a little snippet here. Yes, resumed the younger stranger after a moment's interval. Two nations, between whom there is no intercourse and no sympathy, who are ignorant of each other's habits, thoughts and feelings, as if they were dwellers in different zones or inhabitants of different planets, who have formed by a different breeding are fed by a different food, are ordered by different manners, and are not governed by the same laws. You speak of, said Egmont hesitatingly, the rich and the poor. Well, it's not as simplistic and stark as that in the novel. It's a very, very intelligent novel. Uh, again, you should read uh, Sybil or the Two Nations, 1845. The book also provides shrewd advice on how to breach the gap. In fact, the very programme of One Nation conservatism Disraeli would later apply. For all their defects, the social and political insights in all his novels, uh, there's another one we should mention, Coningsby, still makes them uh, recommended reading for aspiring politicians. Yes, if you want to become a politician, I think you should read the novels by uh, Disraeli. Next, we ought to mention Mrs. Gaskell, Elizabeth Gaskell. She first took to writing to escape the grief of having lost a child, and many of her novels have indeed a strong family theme, with specific mother-to-child relationships explored at length. Yet she was also from a non-conformist family and possessed definite social and political ideas. In Mary Barton and in her masterpiece North and South, another key book, she combines the romantic intrigues of a novel of sentiment with very perceptive socio-economic commentary. Many other novels of the same character, uh, for instance, Kingsley's novel, uh, focused on Charterton, Orton Locke, uh, could also be uh, listed. But mainly, we have to mention Disraeli and Mrs. Gaskell. 
Under pressure of events, social realism had thus entered the English novel and somehow would never leave it until the end of the period. Even Charlotte Bronte has an element of social realism. I would say even Oscar Wilde. We must also mention a few minor trends in that uh, period of early Victorian prose. A legacy of Romanticism can be traced in the persistence of the historical novel. Though often forgotten or neglected today, historical novels, often branching towards adventure, were among the best sellers of early Victorian times. Uh, w. H. Ainsworth made the most of public appetite for criminal lives in fiction, the so-called Newgate novels, and this uh, English equivalent to Alexandre Dumas fed a whole generation with his Jack Shepherd and many other stories of past misdeeds and flamboyance. Likewise, uh, Lord Lytton, Edward Bulwer Lytton, made a fortune with The Last Days of Pompeii, Rienzi or Zanoni. Somehow, even Thackeray tapped into this vein with his Barry Lyndon. Next, of course, we must discuss the mid-Victorian greats, the great novelists of the, uh, the mid-Victorian era. Though often rising to prominence in the late 40s, great mid-Victorian novelists were such unique and often multifaceted talents in themselves that they cannot be studied according to genre. Um, individual accounts are necessary. Uh, the Bronte sisters, of course. Though some have tried to pin them down as a resurgence of Romanticism, the three daughters of Reverend Patrick Bronte, writing in the seclusion of Haworth on the Yorkshire Moors, cannot be limited to this. They were certainly fed by Byronic and Chilean fantasies, uh, their famous imaginary childhood worlds of Gondal and Angria, but there's, there's much more to it. The year 1847 saw the publication of three novels under masculine pseudonyms by Charlotte, Emily and Anne, respectively Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey. While Anne's was a fairly standard life of a governess story, her later The Tenant of Welfare Hall is probably more interesting. The other two were absolute masterpieces. Though Jane Eyre can be approached from the autobiographical point of view, like Charlotte's other three novels, Shirley, Villette and The Professor, to attempt reduction is pointless, to account for the formidable narrative talent and thematic inputs of, among others, concealed madness and tragedy. Likewise, Wuthering Heights, Emily's only novel, defies interpretation. Ordinary standards of human nature seem inappropriate for this extraordinary saga of two families and a love bond bordering on the supernatural. Heathcliff and Catherine still tower today on the windswept moorland. Um, Professor Jean Raymond, and he's not the only one, termed it one of the masterpieces of universal uh, literature. So again, I mean, it's something you have to do once in your life. You really have to read Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. It's totally indispensable. Since we're talking about giants, we must mention Charles Dickens. Um, Dickens, 1812-1870, and his work form a continent. But I have to keep this short presentation limited to key facts and characteristics. No writer before him had enjoyed comparable popularity. This much thanks to talent, but also to a new medium for spreading literary creations, the press, especially uh, via instalments in newspapers or magazines, that is, publication of segments, feuilleton, later on gathered up as volumes. So, typically, you could test the potential of the novel. And if indeed it was successful in the press, you were sure it would be also successful as books. And somehow you cashed in twice. Uh, and Victorians, though the price of books was still very high, 
uh, grew more and more not only literate, literacy was on the rise of course, but also ready to spend some amount of money on books. So it's a great period of expansion for not only writers, but also publishers and illustrators. A typical Victorian novel would be a three-decker. That is a very large three-volume combo, you see. Perhaps another reason for his success was because Dickens had personal experience of the all-pervading fears gnawing at the hearts of most mid-Victorians, engaged from childhood onwards in a permanent struggle against want and isolation, in a world definitely without a welfare state, without any moral excuses for weakness, without much pity at all, for those trodden down, defrauded or deemed useless. His own father had gone to prison for debt and he himself had worked as a young boy in a shoeblack factory. Promoting the gospel of reform with his liberal friends, i.e. a modicum of state intervention, to remedy the ills of all-out utilitarian theories and laissez affair, Dickens wanted to protect men from the distress, physical and moral, that he and his parents had experienced. Now on the right here in this uh, list, I have provided uh, the main works. So starting with the Pickwick Papers and ending with the unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Uh, well, a Dickens lover would say you should read them all, but uh, I have tried to highlight three which I would consider uh, major indispensable ones. Oliver Twist, Bleak House and Great Expectations. Though, okay, this is completely debatable. Which one is the masterpiece? Uh, are there only masterpieces? All of that is debatable, but at least those three, Oliver Twist, Bleak House, Great Expectations, you, you, should, you should read those. This was not clamouring for revolution. Dickens is not a sort of rebel or any sort of socialist, let alone communists. Uh, bear in mind that those political theories were emerging, especially communism, uh, communism after the 1840s. No, he's only calling for alleviation, common sense altruism, and indeed Christian charity. Hence the naive label of Christmas philosophy to qualify his ideas when he first spelled them out in A Christmas Carol. Yet his love for the people is also a love for people in general, a fascination for human character as deep as that of Dostoevsky. Though his first narratives may seem inherited from the picaresque tradition or the Newgate novel, as early as Oliver Twist, his scope and talent leaves those models far behind. Again, though it is undeniable that Dickens relies on a number of well-tested techniques, um, for instance, his famous and obvious re-effication of some characters, reduction to mechanical objects. His perception and description of human life is miles away from the powers of any hack. Um, pathos is one thing, you can accuse him of that, but growing crescendo, novel after novel, Dickens will reach genuine heights of tragedy and madness. Metaphysical madness. For instance, in the late, very difficult and hypnotizing, Our Mutual Friend. Anyway, uh, dis, you know, disputing Dickens' talent is pointless, and <laughs> nearly all of them are must-reads.